We are Chris Lee and Blake Lovell to Southeastern 14. It is bracketology time in the SEC. Blake, it's that time of the year. We can sniff March from here. You, you got bubble teams. You got one seed. You got teams playing in, teams playing out. It's all the stuff we love about college basketball. Now, there's one thing we don't love. Your voice. <laughs> your voice is kind of on the bubble as we, uh, <laughs> as we do this show today. The gladiator I, I'm hoping scene. it's right? we're hoping your voice ends the the episode is is bubble in and not bubble out. No. Uh, and, and if it's bubble out, I don't know what we're gonna do. But it's last four out right now. So it is last four out. We're gonna see if we can play your way into the into the field while mm. we're doing this. And so for for that reason, all kidding aside. We are going to put Blake, uh, to use another sports term, on a, on a pitch count a little bit. Um, you need me for the later innings. Change, man. You know, you, you, you might have a guy on a, So we, we do, but you may have a guy on a you know a pitch count of ninety, and he's throwing a perfect game. Mm. Like, hey, the the last fastball was ninety seven. We can we can stretch this out another inning or two. So that's where we are. Yeah. All right, you've heard enough of my rambling. Uh, with that, we are going to pick our spots here. We're going to start at the top. And look, Alabama was a one seed in Joe Lenardi's bracket earlier in the week. If Alabama had lost to South Carolina, then maybe would have had a discussion as to where Alabama drops the seed line. Uh, that did not happen. So we're just going to kind of move on over Alabama because the Crimson Tide will still be on the one seed line and move down to the next team in the bracket. And that's Tennessee, which was on Lenardi's three line. We have talked about the Vols metrics all year. We also try to pay attention to what happens around other teams. And one thing happened last night, a note, Blake. Virginia and Boston College, which are both in that three seed range, according to Lenardi's earlier bracketology early in the week. Virginia lost in Boston College last night. Now, I know Tennessee has been on a, a skid of late, and let me just give you the metrics for the Vols. The Vols are in the predictive computers. KPI 9, strength to resume 15. That is a numerical measure of where Tennessee's resume might stand as best that can be done. That averages out to 12, which will put Tennessee very much as a low three seed. You, you could see the Vols on the four in some next brackets. Predictive computers like Tennessee, we have joked all year about how Ken Palm doesn't move the Vols down no matter what. Well, you're starting to see some movement there. BPI's got Tennessee at three. Ken Palm has got Tennessee at six. Sagarin's got Tennessee at six. I think as of a week ago, the Vols were two in both those. So, the predictive computers are starting to like Tennessee less as the losses pile up. Quads. Uh, Tennessee is five and five, quad one, four and three, quad two, five and oh, quad three, six and oh, quad four. Records cross places, 12 and two at home, four and five on the road, four and one neutral. Tennessee, where it has problems, Blake, is the quads don't look great. In terms of just what they are, the road record at four and five, not good either. However, when you start to dig in, Tennessee's got wins over Alabama and Texas at home, Kansas on a neutral site. Again, those, those are three teams you could all see as ones on Selection Sunday. A lot of other good wins too. Maryland, which seems to be moving up a little bit, beat Auburn at home, beat Southern Cal on a neutral floor in a sweep over Mississippi State. You got a lot of things that are very lukewarm on the Vols, but those three big wins too, Blake. Um, if you wonder why Tennessee's not sliding down seed lines faster as the losses pile up, it's the predictive cute computers. It's a fact that a lot of Tennessee's losses have been close, and it's a fact that the Vols have, frankly, I don't think any team in the country can match Tennessee's three best wins. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um you know, we always joke about the Tennessee staying at three in the net rankings and all that. But, I mean, like we said, if you're just looking at the net, scoring margin, all the efficiency numbers, all that stuff matters. So, but, yeah, I mean, I think Tennessee is, I mean, what would you say, at worst, they play South Carolina at home, Arkansas at home, at Auburn. I think they're finishing at least two and one. Um, 
And with that, I think that's going to lock up a three seed. Um, that's just my opinion. I don't know if it holds, but like you said, it's the good wins they have. Some of their losses are very close, and that, and that will matter, as we talked about before. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't really see Tennessee falling below the p- protected seed line or seed range by any means, unless, again, you just play the ultimate doomsday scenario of them losing to South Carolina. Something like that. I just I think they're going to be fine. So, yeah. Once you start banking a lot of great resume <laughs> traits, the last week of February, it's very hard to slide down. I mean, wor- worse. Like if if everything went complete disaster, which I'm not predicting, Tennessee would be what a, a five still, Blake. Yeah, and and let me just quickly before I forget this, like remember too, I think some people, and I, I've probably been guilty of this before the anticipation of thinking that one result is going to change one game is one game result is going to change what you've done the previous 28 games. Right. And like for Tennessee, it's that kind of scenario where we talk about teams kind of doing their work up front. Well, Tennessee did a lot of their work up front and yeah, they're struggling a bit, but like they put themselves in a position where even with the struggling, they're, they're still in a very fine spot. So I know it's easy to do that, especially if, you know, it's just a a win or a loss that comes out of nowhere. But really, you know, it's not like, I mean, the Vanderbilt loss, I guess, is bad now in a sense that, you know, Vanderbilt is out of the tournament picture at this moment. We'll get to them, I'm sure, at the end. But otherwise, like, you know, they lose at home to to Arkansas. That really doesn't change Tennessee's overall resume very much. Um, You know, so I think you have to keep that in mind, too. One game result is not just going to immediately wipe out the previous 28 games. And especially as you just said, when you get to this point in the season where there's only three or something games left. So, well, yeah, I mean, th- there's nothing that's just really bad on Tennessee's resume. It's that, that you would have liked to seen the quad one and two records be a little better. But as you dig into those, I mean, look, there are two teams probably in front of Tennessee, uh, well, depending on what you do with Virginia, that have got a quad three or four loss. Quad three in particular. Houston's got one that came to Temple. And Virginia picked one up at Boston College last night. So uh, there's not a lot of just really bad stuff on Tennessee's resume. Tennessee's got some great high-end wins, some some nice kind of in-the-middle wins against other teams that are going to the tournament. And really, once you get to this point, once you bank so much in those top three or four seed lines, it's really hard to to move up or down a whole lot. So... Now, you can't say that about the rest of the SEC teams. Let's see, the next team that Joe Lenardi had, and and I will dig in a little bit more on these in the coming days uh, and probably offer some of my own thoughts as I'm able to do the research and do it. The next two teams Lenardi had in the SEC are AM and Kentucky, which frankly are moving – Pretty close to lock status. To me, a lock, Blake, is when you can lose out, lose your remaining games, and lose your first-round conference tournament game. I I don't know if – is either team there yet to where A&M and Kentucky could both go 0-4? I I, I don't know that they're there yet, but they're awfully close is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, they're very close um, because, again, that's the doomsday scenario we talk about every year at this time, and – if you want to look at the schedules, <clears throat> A&M's at Mississippi State, quad one loss, right? At Ole Miss, that's a what probably quad three, something like that, maybe more um, at this point. Alabama at home, that's a quad one loss. So I, I think A&M is, like you said, you, you don't want to put it in the – because I've said this to people too the last couple of days. We can't tell you who they're going to play in the, the SEC tournament right now. So it's like we can't give you that scenario. We can only give you the next three games, and that's their next three games. Kentucky's final three are home against Auburn, home against Vanderbilt at Arkansas. I don't think either team's losing out, so I don't think it matters. But if they did, I still think they would probably be fine. <laughs> but again, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, wouldn't root for that if I was either team. But um, they they have moved closer to the lock status than any other SEC teams we've seen this season, right? Because we've always talked about Alabama and Tennessee, and now I think we've finally got a couple that are that are going to be just fine and fully locked in, um, I think, again, barring just the doomsday scenario, perhaps. 
All right. I, I've got a sheet that I use and, and I sent Blake a copy um, and hopefully he's not dizzy and looking at it, but it's got about everything on there. Cause I like to, to move teams up and compare them line to line. I also like to go beyond the quads and see what the wins were against teams that got a chance to make the tournament. Sometimes you'll get a, you know, a quad one win that was on the road against 75 net. It's a team that isn't going to sniff the tournament. Sometimes a quad two win will be against the team that's 31 in the net. And it, it's, it's home. It's a, it's a great win. So I like to dig in a little bit on the, the nuances of quad wins. And here's what A&M has done. It has beaten Tennessee, which, again, is going to be probably a, a top – you know, uh, probably on the three or four seed line. Maybe, maybe two if the balls get hot. Who knows? Uh, you got Arkansas, which we'll get to the Arkansas team in just a minute. But we believe the Razorbacks will be in at this point a sweep over Auburn, sweep of Missouri. That's what A and M has done: six wins against teams that I think we think would be in the field today. Kentucky's a uh, little, little <clears throat> dicier. Sweep of Tennessee, which looks great. So that's two high end wins. A win over AM at home and a win at Mississippi State for what that's worth. It's going to be worth something, uh, but his state a tournament team, uh, that's very much to be determined. But um, uh, other than that, I don't think Kentucky has beaten a team that's going to be in the tournament unless you're looking at you know, maybe a, a 15 or 16 seed that gets an auto bid. Yeah, I, I still think Kentucky's fine. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, to, to, to be clear, I think Kentucky's in the tournament today, and I think it's getting pretty close to to cementing that. The, the predictive metrics are, are there, certainly in range. The strength of resume stuff, uh, KPI's got them 29. ESPN strength of resume at 30. I mean, every all the all the numerical metrics are right there for Kentucky. I just think the Cats need another win or two just against pretty much anybody. Um, and, and and probably another nice win against a tournament team would would make you sleep a little better if you're a Kentucky fan. Well, we got two opportunities, Auburn and Arkansas. So, yeah, I think Kentucky – maybe the better question is what happens if Kentucky wins out or win yeah. the next two and lose at Arkansas. Um, that, that one at Arkansas would be huge because I think that bumps them up a – which, of course, again, remember, we're saying this in hypotheticals. That, that obviously would depend on what happens the two games before that. But I think it's a, it's an interesting thought. What happens if Kentucky wins out? Um, I mean, they could move up probably. Once again, I, I said this previously. I, I would not want to be the team that is the one seed or the two seed that finds Kentucky as an eight or a seven. Because I no. just – I the way they're playing right now, I wouldn't love that scenario. So, Yeah. <clears throat> feels a little similar to North Carolina a year ago, doesn't it? Um, well, I think Kentucky's top end wins were better than Carolina's were coming into the maybe. tournament. Yeah, I'd have to look back at that. I'm not sure. Yeah. Plus, I don't know that Carolina was as highly rated preseason as Kentucky was. But anyway, we you can look that up. Okay, next team that Lenardi had in the SEC had Arkansas as a nine. We have talked about the Razorbacks. Weird season. We have talked about Nick Smith coming back. That is only going to help if he plays well, which he did last time out. He hit, what, 24 or 26 against Georgia in that route. Okay, net for Arkansas is 16. Strength of schedule, 47. Non-conference strength of schedule, 95. So nothing glaring there that, that keeps Arkansas out. Predictive metrics, KP, excuse me. Um, love them. BPI 13, Ken Palm 15, Sagra 19, overall record is 19 and 9, 8 and 7 in the league. That might be the one thing you want to make sure you're you're 9 and 9 in the league. I think Arkansas is going to take care of that. Wins of importance, San Diego State on neutral neutral floor back around Thanksgiving. Home wins over Missouri and AM and Kentucky on the road. Arkansas could stand to put together another nice win or two just to, to make sure and Maybe improve the seating line, but I think when you think consider all things, uh, I have a hard time thinking Arkansas is going to be left out on Selection Sunday. Yeah, the only scenario I think where it gets interesting is you said you think they're going to get to nine, but when you look at their remaining schedule at Alabama, at Tennessee, home against Kentucky, 
I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility they could lose all three. And, you know, that's where eight and ten, uh, maybe things get a little more interesting at that point. But the good news, right, is you have no bad loss opportunities left, minus an SEC tournament opponent that, you know, again, that's the only option at this point because they're not, they don't exist in the next three. So I think Arkansas just gets one of those. They're a lock. Um, and, and, you know, some people say, well, maybe they're a lock already. I, and that's, that's the thing, right, is we're trying to give you the scenarios of, look, just set aside all the bubble teams for, for, every, for, for right now. You know, let's just look at this team as a whole. But when you can factor in those bubble teams and what if they don't do enough behind them to move up, then – there is a lot more wiggle room for some of these teams. And so that may wind up being the case. Maybe one of these bubble teams just completely starts losing down the stretch, but maybe the teams behind them don't do enough to move ahead of them. And, you know, so you got to factor that into, I, I think Arkansas is going to be fine. We talked about the Nick Smith effect that will be weighed. Um, again, even if they lose out, I would have to think that they're probably still going to be okay. Even if, I mean, and I'm saying that right as the guy who thinks they got to get to nine and nine in SEC play. But I think what Arkansas has going for them that a Mississippi State does not, the Nick Smith thing is, we said, that's going to be factored in. Even though he's back for these last three, you can use that for some of the other losses, right? And so I think Arkansas' situation is a lot more interesting if they go 8-10 and 10 versus Mississippi State going 8-10, and 10, um, which, as we hear, what when I say, yeah, 8-10, and 10, because it's it's a lot more, you know, there's a different storyline in play. So, but if I was Arkansas and I wanted to feel completely safe, I would win one of these final three, which I think they'll have a chance to do the way they're playing, but um, it will not be easy. And so, yeah, I, I think the hogs will, I think the hogs will be loading up the must bus for another trip into the, the madness. So. Yeah. Obviously Alabama could lose out and still make it. You could say the same thing about Tennessee. I think Tennessee could go 0 for three and then lose one in well, the yeah, SEC there. tournament. Vols, Vols still in. And and this is here's one of this is my definition of a lock. Okay. A lock is when you can face right. plant on every game left on your schedule and still make it. I think that I think Arkansas is there. I I really do. The more I look at it, I think they're there. Unless pro- probably it's, unless it's losing to a non NCAA tournament team in the first round of the SEC tournament. Yeah, because look at their look at the the metrics. You said it yesterday. The computers love Arkansas, love them, and the computers love them. Nick Smith hasn't played a lot, and now that he's back, they clearly look like a different team. At least the games he's played, majority of the games, you know, majority of the minutes, and I think that is going to factor in. So, I Arkansas is is there. I, I just I said. I, for me, you know what I'm looking at. And I know people say, well, the committee says they don't factor in the conference record. I'm not buying it. Not not in some of these instances. This year, perhaps for Arkansas, because they have a unique situation. But I think they're there because of how much the computers love them. Here's the way I'm going to put it, okay? If you want to argue with me that, that A&M, Kentucky, Arkansas are in already, no matter what. I'm not going to tell you 100% certainty that you're wrong. <laughs> I think you give any of those three teams a win against anybody. And, and I'm, I mean, boring something really crazy, right? Because you, you're always affected by other teams. And it's not like the field's going to be named today and any of these teams are going to be a five or something like that. But what I would say is I think AM, Kentucky, Arkansas beat anybody at any time from here on out in the regular season. And, and or maybe just one in the tournament, and I, I don't see any of those getting left out. That is that is my play it safe take. I'm not saying that that all three of those teams couldn't lose out and still get in, but I'm just saying my degree of confidence, just to use a little caution here, say I, I'm just going to say any of those teams win one more in the regular season, and and it's case closed. I'm with you. Okay, Missouri, Blake. I, I think Missouri's probably in that category too. Mm. Just because of what it is banked, 
I think you're right. You're but, not you're not as convinced. But yeah. if okay. you're playing, Missouri has a different schedule, and that's why I worry a little bit for Missouri. Because they have three opportunities to completely implode their NCAA tournament yeah. resume. And that's my only hesitation with saying that with Missouri is they're playing Georgia, LSU, Ole Miss. And as of right now, those are all three bad losses if you lose those games, any of them. And I think you're right. And that's why the Mississippi State game was so huge. But if you hear the hesitation, for me, it's because that. It is – if the doomsday scenario for Missouri is – missing the tournament based on a an inexplicable <laughs> losing streak to three of the bottom four teams or five teams in the SEC. And so they don't have the luxury I think the other teams have. But like you said, if they win one of those three, I think they're still okay. But the, the computers don't love Missouri. And that's the opposite with Arkansas is right. The computers are not in love with Missouri. And so that's the only hesitation I would have. Well, from my experience, the <laughs> NCA almost always leans on the side of what you have banked. Yeah. And banking big wins means more than anything. And my goodness, Missouri has banked a bunch of them at Tennessee Iowa State, Arkansas, Kentucky at home, Mississippi State at home for that's worth, and Illinois on a neutral floor. That is why I think maybe maybe Missouri might be in that category too. One more win, and I, I think certainly two more, Missouri can feel great about it. I'm looking up the quads because I think Georgia now – okay, here, here is a potential problem for LSU. We've talked about how Missouri's got a really clean sheet, okay? No losses outside of quad one where the Tigers are five and eight. Lose at Georgia, lose at LSU. Those are both quad three losses. Now, Missouri, I think, could, with what it is banked, probably survive one of those. Could it survive two? Uh, that's that's maybe where it gets a little dicey. So, now, the other thing is, if you're looking at the, the things held against you, and we'll get to this with Mississippi State. Missouri's got a non-conference strength of schedule at 199 as of this morning. This morning being Thursday morning, and my source on that being Warren Nolan. So there, there are some blemishes against the Tigers with the possibility of more blemishes on the horizon with those two road games, but – Going by what Missouri has banked and what generally gets you in the tournament, that is a rock-solid body of work that that pretty much 100 times out of 100 is going to get you in, barring disaster somewhere. Two and one, and you're safe. One and yes. two with a loss in the SEC tournament, and I would not be thrilled about the setup. Um, yeah. It's because, again, I, I think – what they have going for them. Good wins, but they also have the clean sheet. Knock on wood again, Missouri fans. Um, if they're able, the only way to keep that a clean sheet is to win out. <clears throat> so, but even if they lose one, they win the other two, they're perfectly fine. So, I just wouldn't have the setup of one and two and lose a first round SEC tournament game. I think that's asking for trouble. And that's asking yeah. the committee to pick you apart a bit. Um, but I think you're right. What they've done is get the big wins, and that's why the Mississippi State game was so important, I thought, was to add another quality win on the resume for now. So, All right, if, if you are Missouri, and this is going to apply to Auburn too, these are the teams you kind of want to keep your eye on right now. Pitt out of the ACC, Rutgers out of the Big Ten, Florida Atlantic out of Conference USA, which is basing its – Success on what a twenty-three and, and three record, which also, by the way, includes a loss, I believe, at Ole Miss. So those are teams that um, you're kind of a competition with. If, if someone else wins Conference USA, that could be bad for Missouri or Auburn if they are on the bubble. Also, watch the Mountain West. You got a lot of Mountain West teams that are just kind of there, 
and most of their big wins are just beating up on each other and counting that the computer kind of likes that league. And I'm not, I'm not being judgmental one way or the other there, but the teams you kind of want to keep an eye on Boise state, which I think picked up a big win over somebody last night. I want to say maybe New Mexico. I think it was Nevada's in there. Um, Utah state's probably in there, New Mexico in there. So those are the teams that if you were Auburn in Missouri and it gets dicey, you're keeping an eye on. Um, now you can, of course, take care of business and, and take it out of the committee's hands, more or less. We've outlined the path for Missouri. Uh, Auburn, boy. The metrics on the Tigers, net 33. So Auburn dropped a little bit by beating Ole Miss at home. And again, part of the reason Auburn dropped it because that was a close game. KPI Auburn at 23, strength of resume at 38. So Auburn starting to maybe drop there a little bit. Predictives, Auburn starting to drop just, just a hair, a spot or two. 21, 22, and 20 between BPI, Ken Palm, and Sagarin. Again, those correlate pretty well with the net. Auburn, 13 and 2 at home, 4 and 6 on the road, 2 and 1 neutral. Here's the problem. Quad one, two and seven, quad two, six and one. Auburn now has a quad three loss at eight and one, and quad four is three. And I, th- I think that's where Auburn actually has, has picked up a little bit in the computers where you're like, how do they get there? It doesn't seem like it. what they've done adds up to what that net number is, but I think only playing three games against quad four teams and not having lost any of those is, is one of those things that you may not pick up on immediately that's helping Auburn. Auburn's wins, it's got wins over Arkansas and Missouri at home. We just talked about those teams in probably that 8-10 to 10 range. A win over Northwestern on a neutral floor, Northwestern in that 5 or 6 range. I don't know that Northwestern is really that strong, uh, but the resume is there, and that's what the committee is going to consider. So that Northwestern win, which I think was 44-43 to 43 on a neutral floor, that's going to help Auburn. And then a win over Mississippi State at home, is helping a little bit state a tournament team. I don't know. We'll get to that in a minute. But Auburn, you've been calling this while. Tigers have got some work to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, I look, Auburn's projected to lose every remaining game that they have. Now, they wouldn't be bad losses because they beat a Kentucky on the road, Alabama on the road, and Tennessee at home. But you'd also at that point be a team that would have lost three, four, five, six, seven. Nine of twelve to finish the season, and I know you can say, "Well, the committee doesn't factor it in." Well, don't kid yourselves. Like they, they may not factor it in technically, but you can't tell me they're going to look at a team that has a finish like that if comparing to other bubble teams that maybe have a stronger finish, and maybe there's just a slight difference between the teams. That is going to have to factor in, um, just in the human element of things. I think so. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I have been kind of saying I I think Auburn's a team that can play their way out, and that's why the Ole Miss game was so important. Because if they lose that one, you know, that's it's, it changes the game completely. And they got it. Um, but I, I think the the path for Auburn actually is is very clear right now. If they can win one of these final three games, I think you can't keep them out. Um, now, again, that's assuming you don't lose in the SEC tournament, which let's we've said that quite a bit, right? But let's remember, what is the value of a win or a loss in the SEC tournament? We don't know that um, because apparently sometimes that's not as significant as you would think. So it will be for some teams, but you just never know. So I think that's it. Um, if they can just get one of these wins, then I think Auburn can exhale a little bit. If they don't, then I think maybe they're in a bit of a tricky spot heading into the SEC tournament to where what they do will matter a lot more because they could be they could be playing the comparison game with other bubble teams, bid stealers, all that. So, um, yeah, that's that's where I'm at on that. All right, next up, Mississippi State. Lenardi had State as its last team in, I think, when he did his bracketology on, what was it, Tuesday? 
State's metrics, 42 in the net, 40 strength to schedule, 225 non-conference strength to schedule. I'm going to put an asterisk to that one and come back to it. The strength of resume computers have got State as a bubble team KPI at 53, strength of resume on the ESPN 48. The predictives like State a little better, 37 BPI, 41 Ken Palm, 43 Jeff Sagarin. Overall record, 18 and 10, that's fine. The, the league record is, is the one that Blake and I brought up over and over, 6 and 9 at this point. Blake has been on record saying he doesn't think State gets in under 9 and 9. I. In my opinion, I think there's a little bit more leeway than that. That is opinion. You may be right about that, Blake, based on the the, the who's and, and what's and where's. State is 10 and 4 at home, 4 and 5 on the road, 4 and 1 neutral, 3 and 7 quad 1, 3 and 2 quad 2, 4 and 1 quad 3 and 8 no quad 4. But State's got some nice wins, Marquette neutral floor, TCU and Missouri at home, and Arkansas on the road. <clears throat> um, what's their non-conference strength of schedule? Well, that's that's the problem, but th- but that also comes with the hey, wait a minute. Um, Marquette is a you know going to be on the four seed line or better probably if that's picked today. TCU is going to be a top you know six you know on the six line or probably or higher. And I know that State won that game without Miles. I get it. How much is the committee going to dig in there? I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm, state is bank, state is bakes banked some nice things. I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, it, but in comparison, I, 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 yeah, I mean, they beat Missouri, they beat Arkansas, like you said, TCU and Marquette. <clears throat> Those are four good wins at the moment. Yeah, um, I just think I'm I'm looking for teams like the bubble teams. I'm looking for things that can keep you out of the tournament. And I think that is at least something that's going to have to be factored in. The non-conference strength of schedule, how does that compare to the other bubble teams? If you go 8-10, and 10, what's what's the tipping? Like, what gets you over the top at 8-10 and 10 in the league? What's the What, what are you leaning on at 8-10 and 10 in the, the SEC? Texas A&M? Uh, yeah, Cause it, I guess. Because then your list of wins is pretty nice. Well, but yeah, I guess that's it. Um, well, I mean, look, North Carolina is a bubble team. Compare what North Carolina has done against good teams look, to Mississippi State's. I, I will say again, I've been using this because of how rare it's been that this has happened. It's only happened once since expansion, and I don't—I couldn't tell you before that for a team to have a losing record in the SEC and make the NCAA tournament. Alabama did that in two thousand, whatever, seventeen, eighteen, on a five-game losing streak in the season. Um, but they had some other things in their favor. And for Mississippi State, it is. It's picking apart what is not in your favor. I think those are a couple things you can point out. Like you said, what is in your favor? Having good wins. Um, And, yes, a win over A&M can reset things a bit because cause that I think that's where you have to play the game of Mississippi State. If they go 8-10 and 10 and finish with a win over A&M, all right, well, that's maybe a little bit different. And maybe that is something you can lean on as our just our quality wins. But if you go 8-10 and 10 with wins over South Carolina and Vanderbilt and lose day in him, well, what are they hanging their hat on outside of just those four wins? And that's what I don't know. And so Mississippi State, I think, will be a team that goes into the SEC tournament one way or the other needing to do something and either avoid a bad loss, get a good win. I just think that's the setup here. But – um, they are an interesting team, as we've talked about before on the bracketologies, because I, it is also a matter of where you're at right now. And right now, they are ahead of some of these teams. You know, they, their resume technically is better than the other bubble teams they're competing against. So you are now in a situation, just like we said with Auburn. We can say if you don't do this or you don't do that, you're not going to get in. But you have to play your way out versus playing your way in, right? Because as of right now, you'd be in. So I think that's the more interesting discussion is if if that's where you see a team like Mississippi State right now, what do you have to do to play your way out? Because you can, you know, if you're in now, just stay the course and, you know, 
get a don't lose a bad game, you know, don't have a bad loss, those kind of things. Like that starts to factor in. But I think my more bigger discussion was I just think to get to nine and nine, you're way more you're a lock at that point. But my bigger thing was don't leave it in the committee's hands if you go eight and ten, because then you have to have a really good something to hang your hat on elsewhere to maybe justify the losing record in, in conference play, which again, I know they say does not matter, but you can't tell me that a team that goes eight and 10 in the sec this season, where a lot of teams are both. And maybe that's the strength of the sec getting stronger. Now where Kentucky and A&M are moving to lock status, Arkansas getting there. It's not just a jumbled mess of five teams that are in the, you know, 10 to 11 seed range. So that, that's going to help Mississippi state perhaps. But they just gotta they still gotta take care of their business to be there. So Yeah, the, the obvious comparison is AM a year ago. There are a lot of similarities there. Uh the, sometimes the committee looks for reasons to justify. And the, the one thing that's staring you in the face is that non conference strength to schedule at two twenty five. And I look back, what was A and M's a year ago? Was it in the three hundreds? Was it in this range? Do you remember where it was? You're muted. Okay. In any case, uh, well, I think Blake's, Blake's voice we may be on the you pitch You wanted count. me on a pitch count. We're 36 minutes into this video, so. Okay, gotcha. Well, I, I will – now, the one difference is that a picked up one quality non-conference win a year ago. That was against – who was it? Notre Dame and State's got two out of conference wins that are that are really nice. But you start looking at the same thing that you, if you're going to put it in the hands of the committee in terms of what you do in the conference tournament, we know where that went a year ago. So I, I do see some similarities between what State did a year ago. A and M finished at nine and nine. Of course, A and M had a rough patch first to the conference schedule. State did too. So there's a lot of parallels there. I'm sure, if you want to dig in on that deeper. You can, but there's a piece or two of the puzzle I'm missing to that as this comes up in our discussion. So anyway, um, to round it out, Florida's got a net that's got the Gators in consideration, but Florida now 14 and 14, no Castleton. So no chance boring a miracle in the SEC tournament that without him is not coming. And Vanderbilt, uh, the Commodores to the point where they're not worth discussing now. Vanderbilt very in position to be in position anyway at best before losing at LSU on Wednesday night. So the Commodores, I mean, even if Vandy goes. And then I, I suppose if Vanderbilt beats State in Kentucky and Lexington, and then who have they got Saturday? Florida. Maybe it's back on the very, very outer edges of the fringe again where we can talk about it. But but boring that, um, I, I think Vandy's done anyway, and certainly one more regular season loss anywhere would do it, Blake. Agreed. All right. <laughs> yes. Yes. No. That's all I'm saying. Predictions are going to be fun. I think that's Predictions are going to be Mike. fun. Blake, who do you have in um, Mississippi State versus Texas A&M? Um, I will take Team A. And just a oh, sense gonna... of silence. So. Do you know sign language? My goodness. All right. <clears throat> That's about where we are. All right. I'm not going to let you end it. I'm going to conserve your voice. I'm just going to say we appreciate you watching. The best way to get our content is hit the subscribe button. That costs you nothing. If you like the video, hit the like button. That does help us get noticed a little bit. We'll have predictions coming up. We'll have some baseball stuff coming up. Um, some of that is going to depend on how much voice Blake has left as to whether we do a preview or whether we just do a recap of weekend stuff. But either way, we are, my goodness, this is like 880 Central this time of the year between baseball and basketball and not just basketball in the conference, but watching at other places to see how that impacts the teams we cover. Uh, Blaine's got football locked down for us. But anyway, if you like your major three sports and Blake, it's also doing a, a Tennessee women's basketball podcast to boot because God knows we don't have enough stuff going on here. 
In any case, thank you, Southeast thank you for watching us in Southeastern 14. That's, that's just all. what you need. Just <laughs> more speaking. Okay. Thanks for watching. He's Blake Lovell. I'm Chris Lee. We're Southeastern 14. We'll see you soon.